think we're live here. Make sure everything works. Uh, okay, we have people showing up. That's great. If people can't hear me, let me know. It looks like the looks like the mic is working. Um, if anybody's having problems, just uh, there we go. Got a thumbs up. Good stuff. All right. Okay, as I mentioned on um, the uh, the intro and and the emails and the posts that I sent out, really just um, really just doing this as a as a test, but it's been it's been great. Lots of people signed up. I think we had forty people sign up. Um, so um, thank you very much for um, for your interest. First time using this software, so hopefully no technical um, issues, but I'm sure we'll we'll work through them as we go. And I got a lot of questions from everybody. So thank you very much for um, all the great questions. Honestly, probably probably too many to get through today, but um, I've kind of listed them out. I haven't gone through them in, in detail at all. So um, I try to just answer these the best I can off the top of my head. And anything I don't get to, um, I'll try to circle back around to those that, that emailed the, the, the questions. Um, so that I don't uh, miss anybody. Okay, all right. Thank you, Ron. All right, so, okay, there we go. Not work, not working too badly. I had some issues this morning with the mic that are now cleared up. So, okay. Uh, so, how many people? We have about twenty here. I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes, just as people might be coming in a little bit later, and then we can kind of get started with the questions that I had. Um, sent to me. Oh, yes. And then one thing I'm going to do that I haven't done yet here. I was going to try to stream this to YouTube as well. So let's see. No, is this not working now? Of course. Okay. Let's try this. It looks like there were some people also that we're waiting on YouTube. Okay, let's see here. That might have worked. I'm, I'm guessing the YouTube stream is not going to be as clear as the um, as the Zoom stream, but I wanted to give it a try here. So let's see if that worked. Hmm. Didn't look like it. Okay, well, my apologies to anybody that's actually on YouTube waiting, but for some reason, let's try this one more time. That's funny, it says it's streaming. Okay, well, that's unfortunate, but I can fix that in the next one. So, and what and what I'll do as well, I'll make sure to post this because um, it'll be recorded as well. So I'll make sure to post this on um, on YouTube and all the other channels once once it's done. So people can replay it, and then I'll, I'll put um, I'll put some timelines with the question on there, so you can kind of click through if there's a question in particular that you wanted to um, to go through. Okay, great. So we have about 23 people here. Um, and once again, as I'm going through these questions, feel free to leave some questions in the Q&A box there. And as I'm going through the questions, I'll kind of circle back around to there, see if anybody has any follow-up questions. So hopefully, as I'm getting through some of them, if, if people have some, um, some questions about the questions, I can answer those as well. Okay, so let's do this. Let's start with the actual webinar here. I have some slides I can use. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see this. And I've really just, I kind of dropped the questions into slides just to make it easier for everybody to kind of follow through or uh, follow along with um, as I'm discussing the, um, the questions. Okay, um, we're gonna start with uh, just a common disclaimer here. This webinar is for educa uh, educational purposes only and should, and should not be construed as professional advice. Your tax and investment situation is unique and requires a competent professional to evaluate your specific set of facts and needs. Please contact a professional to receive advice on your tax accounting or investment situation. Okay, I'm sure everybody understands that. So 
now that we have that out of the way, let's, um, yeah, let's just try to kind of work through some of these questions here. Okay, so, and these, none of these are in, in any particular order. And I also, um, this morning, there was a bunch of other signups uh, that came in uh, with some questions. So they're not on here. So if we have time, I'll circle back around to those because um, there were some good questions in there, but um, I think there were maybe four or five. Okay, so question number one. Uh, Canada Revenue adjusted my return, uh, my returns and say I owe them another $900. They changed my foreign tax credit calculation on my returns and I could only get 15% US tax on my US pensions. My accountant says, said that it wasn't worth the fight with CRA and I had, um, and had to pay the amounts. Do you, I need a second opinion. Okay, so I, th I think I know, I think I know what happened. And when was, with a lot of these questions, I don't have full context. So I'm going to do my best to answer them. Uh, but if I'm missing some information, you know, it's going to be tough. So um, if, if for some reason I don't answer your question the way um, you think it, it probably should be answered because I'm missing that info, just just um, shoot me an email. Uh, so in this case, it sounds so, so what happens is when when you claim a foreign tax credit on your Canadian return in a lot. And we know that clients know this. You, you, you often get a review letter from CRA. So let's say you claim a two thousand dollar foreign tax credit on your Canadian tax return. You e-file the return, you know, in April you get to June or August or even September, or even we're getting these still in the fall, CRA will send you a review letter saying, can you please um, show us the calculations for the $2,000 uh, foreign tax credit? Now, in this case, that's probably what happened. They probably received the letter. Uh, they sent in either their US, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume in this case that this is a US citizen living in Canada. So they sent in probably their US return or a transcript showing how much US tax they paid. Um, and they and they likely have gotten a response because it's been assessed here, and they they know they owe a specific amount of extra tax. Uh, they likely claim more than fifteen percent. So why why can you only claim fifteen percent tax uh, on U.S. pensions? So um, and, we, and once again, we're we're going to try not to get too technical um, today, but just generally speaking. So um, for Canadian residents that. Uh, earn U.S. pension income, uh, the, the top rate of tax uh, in terms of withholding or just tax that you should be paying in general under the treaty is 15%. So let's say they actually paid 20% on their U.S. tax return on their U.S. pension. Then they try to claim 20% tax on their, uh, uh, on their Canadian tax return. CRA would only give them credit for 15. So that's probably the difference. And the difference is them just kicking out the difference between whatever makes up the $900. So the difference between 15 and what they claimed. Um, and then the question, well, how do you resolve this? So likely, if that's the case, the Canadian return now is correct because they've adjusted it. What you have to do is go back and correct the U.S. return. So the way it should have looked on the U.S. return, you should have only paid a maximum of 15% on the U.S. pension. And the way you do that is you use um, that form 1116, which is the foreign tax credit form on the U.S. 1040. Um, and there's a bunch of different pools and different, um, uh, uh, not ways in which you do that form, but there's different, um, there's different pools of income for that 1116 foreign tax credit. So there's a general pool, there's a passive pool for investment, um, and then there's a resource pool. And a resor all the resource pool does is um, reduce um, uh, specific amounts of tax on specific um, income down to the treaty rate. So you would, you would claim a resource foreign tax credit on the US return to get down to 15%. So if you do that, then the result should be you pay 15% on the US um, pension in the US, um, and then you pay whatever tax you pay in Canada and you get credit for 15%. So um, long story short, it looks like CRA likely made the right adjustment. Um, the accountant, so I, I would say the accountants, if that's the case, I would say the accountant's wrong. You, 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 I mean, it's not, the, it's not even a fight with CRA at this point. Um, it's just a matter of uh, adjusting the U.S. return. So it sounds like CRA is right. Once again, if, if I got any of that wrong in terms of the fact pattern, let me know. But I think that's what, um, what happened. Okay, so I think we've, we've answered that one. Um, okay, I'm just going to just keep checking the questions from the group if anybody has anything. But it looks like we're good. So let's move on to question number two. Okay, um, question number two. Can we claim... Uh, Canadian mortgage interest deduction on our American taxes. Uh, and then number two, how does the Canadian mortgage impact our taxes, if at all? Okay, um, we get this question a lot. Uh, this has changed a little bit. So um, new tax changes only allow you to claim 
mortgage interest up to $750,000 of mortgage where it was a million dollars before. But honestly, I mean, this would be a different conversation for like domestic Americans, Americans living in, in the US. But for Americans living in Canada, you know, so these deductions, you know, there's lots of deductions that happen on Schedule A. So this would be your itemized deductions. In a lot of cases, we don't bother because a lot of cases, you know, you're not going to end up paying U.S. tax anyway. So it doesn't really matter how much you drive down your U.S. tax because you have enough Canadian tax to offset any U.S. tax that you um, that you pay. I mean, that's not always the case. You might have situations where in, in Canada, you you know, have a really large RSP deduction that you don't get on the US side. So that really drives down your Canadian tax. So you do want to find ways to, to reduce your US tax. But in a lot of cases, we don't, we don't bother with mortgage interest deduction. It's just more time on, on the files um, and doesn't add any value. So, um, so I'd say in most cases, there's not an advantage. Um, unless your Canadian tax rate is really low. But if your Canadian tax rate is really low, it's, it's often that your U.S. tax rate is low as well. Um, oh, and then number two, how does the Canadian mortgage impact your taxes at all? I mean, honestly, unless, I mean, I'm assuming this is on a principal residence. Unless it's it's on rental income, which you get a deduction for against other income, it probably doesn't, you know, we could get into, you know, converting the mortgage to be able to, to deduct it for investment purposes, but we're not going to get into that today, but likely doesn't impact taxes um, at all. Okay, uh, let's just check here. Uh, oh, okay, um, so there was a question that just came in here from probably the previous question. Are distributions taken from a fixed annuity considered distributions? Yes, in most cases from a fixed annuity would be considered distributions from a pension and would attract the same 15% tax. So here, let me, let, me just, um, uh, let me just circle back around to that. Um, so the 15% will relate to um, U.S. pensions paid to a Canadian resident, regardless of whether that individual is a U.S. citizen. So it'll be 15%. So it's going to be a max of 15%. So if you're a non-resident of the U.S., uh, you don't file U.S. tax returns, you're in Canada, you'll always have a 15% withholding on the taxable portion of the pension. Because often there'll be a taxable portion and there'll be a non-taxable portion. So on the taxable portion of the pension. Uh, and on the U.S. side, you're going to pay whatever U.S. tax on your US tax return, but only to a maximum of 15. So um, for non-residents of the US, it'll always be 15. For American citizens or green card holders, it'll be um, whatever your tax rate is US up to a maximum of, of 15. Okay, uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, uh, another good question. Same as uh, U.S. Social Security pensions. No, U.S. Social Security pensions are completely different. So in that case, um, U.S. Social Security is only taxable in the country where you're a resident. So for you know most of our clients are Americans living in Canada. So U.S. Social Security is only taxable on the Canadian return. And we put disclosures in the U.S. return uh, to explain under the treaty why um, U.S. Social Security is only taxable in Canada, uh, and that would be the inverse would be true. But if you're in the U.S. and you're claiming so, you're being taxed on Social Security, you're not often filing Canadian returns. So, uh, yeah, completely different. Often, no withholding at all on U.S. Social Security, um, and then the difference being you're only taxed on 85% of your U.S. Social Security in in Canada. But in order for it not to be um, uh, taxable on the um, on the U.S. return, you have to put in treaty elections. Um, okay. Just reading somebody else have anything else. Okay, good question here. Okay, so what happens if, uh, for a Canadian resident, a non-U.S. person, the U.S. source pension um, does not withhold any tax? Okay, so this happens a lot. So, um, I mean, you want to avoid that if you can. So if you get, uh, if you're a Canadian resident, non-US person, um, and you get, um, if, and you get um, payments from US pensions and they don't withhold, I mean, you want to avoid that. So make sure if you know you're going to be receiving uh, payments, make sure to ask them um, to withhold taxes and they're going to ask for that W-8 Ben uh, form. And if you're American, the W-7. 
Um, but if they don't, then you're the only way to correct that because it, it's not it's not often that I mean, it, it's often that they don't withhold, sometimes they over withhold. So if they over withhold or they under withhold, you have to file a 1040 NR. So 1040 NR is a non resident US tax return, you would file that to pay the appropriate amount of US tax and then whatever tax is um, calculated on that return, you get a credit for just like if it was withholdings. Okay. All right. Thank you for those questions. Great questions. So let's move to the next, um, let's move to the next question here. Okay. I recently inherited a US IRA from my mother in the US. Can I transfer it to my RSP? Um, okay, so once again, assuming this individual lives in Canada. Um, so inherited IRAs, uh, so, so let me back up. So there's an opportunity to convert or, or roll or, or transfer. Um, U.S. IRAs into an RSP. It can be tricky because generally speaking, you need an, an amount of income equal to the amount you transfer. So let's say you inherit a five hundred thousand um, dollar, or not inherit. If you have a five hundred thousand dollar IRA and you wanted to transfer it into your um, RSP, and let's say you made a hundred thousand dollars a year, it would take about five years to do that transfer. So honestly, it's kind of a pain, and it doesn't often um, provide a ton of value. Uh, but in cases of inherited IRAs, inherited IRAs uh, are not eligible for the transfer regardless. So, um, so in this case, um, this individual cannot uh, transfer the IRA to their RSP. Uh, so, so then the question is, you know, what are the options with, uh, with IRAs? In most cases, I mean, if it's really, really small and your income's really, really low, like you might, you know, you inherit a $20,000 IRA and your income's really, um, uh, really low, perhaps it makes sense just to deregister it, pay the tax um, and move on. Um, but if it's a larger IRA, and especially if you have income, you really just want to stretch it out for as long as you can. You have 10 years now to, to withdraw the funds from the inherited IRA. So I would say, you know, move it up to Canada with a good cross-border investment advisor, um, have them manage it up here, and then slowly just, you know, pull the money out. You have 10 years, you know, max of 10 years to, to pull the money out. Um, and that way you can defer um, as much taxes as possible. Um, okay, let's check. I don't think we had any other questions on that one. And once again, don't hesitate to give me some feedback if, um, if I'm going too fast or if the mic's, it uh, looks like the mic's working or, or anything else um, would be appreciated. Okay, so let's go to the next one here. Uh, once again, I haven't even looked at these in detail. So, um, okay, so what are your thoughts on a US person resident in Canada holding a TFSA? Okay, such a popular question. I do realize the income and capital gains are taxed on the 1040. And there's no FTC offset, so that's foreign tax credit. However, in some circumstances, the Canadian tax savings may be worth owing some tax to the U.S. depending on the overall tax situation. What's your perspective? Okay, so great question. So um, once again, TFSAs with Americans living in Canada have been a thorn in our side forever. Um, you know, the TFSA account. I mean, you know that um, when that came in, I mean that that was an idea kind of uh, brought up from the U.S. for the you know similar to the the Roth IRAs. The problem with the TFSAs was a couple of problems. First, um, like this individual mentioned, TFSAs uh, are tax deferred. So any any income earned within the TFSA. Uh, um, is not tax deferred, but tax exempt from a Canadian standpoint, but not so for the US. So let's say you have a TFSA, it earns you know $1,000 of interest um, every year, um, and you're an American living in Canada, that $1,000 is not taxed on the Canadian side, but it is taxable for uh, US purposes, just as if it was in a regular um, investment account. So this, in, um, and, and then the second thing is, some make the argument um, or some consider the TFSA to be a foreign trust for U.S. purposes, and therefore we have those terrible 3520 forms. I'm not going to get into that today, but um, yeah, so 3520 form is a form to report, um, amongst other things, um, interest in a foreign trust, so a non-U.S. trust. Uh, so some people are doing 3520s for TFSA. Some are making the argument that TFSA is not a foreign trust and therefore not doing 3520s, but there's still a risk because the IRS hasn't explicitly come out and and um, and spoken on this matter. I mean, they're they're so busy with with other things. I can't imagine they're going to get to this anytime soon. So th you know, there's the risk. But outside of the 3520, uh, the one thing I do want to point out here, um, they say, do I um, I realize that income capital gains are taxed on the 1040 and no FTC off offset, which is well. So uh, certainly the income is going to be taxable on your 1040. But in some cases, you actually might have foreign taxes paid on other investment income that was carried forward from previous years that you can offset um, because foreign tax credits carry forward 
on the US return. So just keep that in mind. You might have already a bunch of passive 1116, that's the foreign tax credit form, um, available to offset that income. So if you were going to make the argument that it wasn't a foreign trust, you're not doing 3520s, and you had this big basket of um, uh, foreign tax credit carry forwards on the passive side, uh, then you could offset that, um, that tax on that TFSA. Okay, um, I don't think we have any additional questions there, so let's just keep uh, moving on. Okay, so this one's a little bit lengthy. So, uh, oh, and then like, I just wanted some of these I actually did kind of break down and paraphrase because they were actually um, quite lengthy. Um, so if I if I took some stuff out of your your question, that that was the reason. Uh, I try to keep the same spirit of the question though. Okay, um, I moved back to Canada after working in the U.S. for many years on TN visa. I'm not a U.S. citizen or green card holder. Okay, as a new tax resident of Canada, I, can, I cannot keep my regular brokerage account in the U.S. Yep, true. Thus, I transferred my sizable stocks in kind to a Canadian brokerage. Okay. Um, I understand that my previous gains accumulated before I entered Canada are protected from Canadian tax, and there's an adjustment cost basis to my stocks to the fair market value. Yep. Um, can you clarify when the adjustment occurred to the FMB? Does this occur on the day I crossed the US-Canada border? Um, or the FMB for the closing price of my share before the day it became rent? Okay, so that might be a little bit confusing people. So, so essentially what this individual is saying, and, and let me back up. So when you, when you move from the US to Canada or on, uh, from anywhere to Canada, you're not going to be taxed on any of your, unless it's Canadian real estate or other Canadian property, you're not going to be taxed on any accrued gains that you earned before you became a Canadian resident. So, you know, simple example, you, you, you bought Apple stock when you lived in the U.S. at $100, and now it's $200, and now you're um, moving to Canada. You move to Canada when Apple stock's $200 and you sell it immediately, um, you pay no tax because you're going to get a bump in your cost base to fair market value. So, the gain from 100 to 200 is protected from Canadian tax. You will still have a gain in the U.S. on the $100, but you essentially get a reset when you uh, uh, move to Canada for any accrued gains that you earned, um, not, not on things like pensions, but just regular investment accounts or, or U.S. real estate uh, when you enter Canada. So th they do that um, so that you're not taxed on you know, many years of, of prior year gains. So this individual is asking, you know, what is the timing of that? Um, I mean, if you look at the Tax Act, you know, they say immediately before, um, and they don't mean the day, but they mean immediately before. So what we, we tend to do, and, you know, in most cases, is not going to make a difference. You just use the closing price on the day you become a Canadian resident and use those values um, as your fair market value when you enter, and that becomes your new cost base for Canadian purposes, um, which, which can actually be quite tricky because then that's why I'm not a big fan of leaving investment accounts in the U.S., first, because a lot of the investments down there, like muni bonds, you know, are not efficient for Canadian purposes. U S dividends often compared to Canadian dividends are not that efficient. Um, and then you have T 11, uh, 35, uh, filings, but not only that, now you have a set of investments and statements that you have a cost base in the U S that's different than the cost base in Canada. So you have to track cost bases on both sides. That's why planning for investments before moving to Canada is really important. Um, but yeah, to answer this question, I would just use the closing price on the day you move to um, Canada, or not the day you move necessarily, but the day that you set up for your residence, which is often the same date. So the day you become a Canadian resident, that would be the day that you use the closing price for all your stocks um, to readjust your basis on the Canadian side. Okay, so hopefully I answered that. Um, let's see. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any other questions here. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, this came in, in just as a, a subject to an email, but I, I, I did respond and ask if it was a question. So dealing with RSP slash IRA for expats living in Canada. So I think maybe they just want a general overview. Um, so let's, you know, let's say you have an RSP and you have an IRA. Uh, I mean, first, if, you know, if you're in your working years, you'll likely contribute to your RSP to reduce your Canadian tax. You won't get it. You won't get a, a deduction on your U.S. tax return for any, for any RSP contributions. However, that won't really matter because we want to drive down Canadian tax as much as we can. And the IRA is either going to be from an inherited IRA or an IRA you had before you moved to Canada and then you moved up here. So the only thing I would say there is um, 
you know, all things being equal, and this is not always the case because RIF or RSPs will convert to RIFs and, and there's some other planning there, but you probably want to draw down on your RSP or RIF before your IRA because your IRA can actually stay deferred as it is inherited down the chain to, um, uh, to uh, other beneficiaries. So that's one of the, the, the bigger advantages. When you pass away, you can roll your RSP to your spouse, uh, but when the last spouse passes away, that RSP comes into income. So that's not the case with IRAs. They can continue on and be tax deferred uh, to the next generation. Now they've capped that at 10 years, but at least you get an extra 10 years, which is a huge amount when, when you're talking about compounding um, uh, going forward. So, I mean, you know, I'm not sure exactly what they wanted um, uh, answered from this question, but it just gives you a good general overview of um, IRAs versus RSPs. Okay, uh, another question. Is there another question here? Uh, what about departing capital gains tax for us okay good question so departing capital gains tax for usa i think there's actually a question below here that that um asks about that so we'll uh, i'll leave this for now and then we'll um, circle back around to that question okay um oh, oh this looks like this is the question okay there you go um i moved I moved from Canada to US um, in August of 98. As required, I filed my departure notice to Revenue Canada for the stock I had and deemed as sold market to market price and paid capital gains tax. Um, so what they're saying there, when you leave Canada, your assets are deemed to be disposed as if you sold them, you pay your exit tax, and then you are a non-resident of Canada. Now, when I sell the stock in the US, sh shall I use the market to market price as my cost base? Makes sense to me or the original acquisition costs um, years before the departure date? Okay, great question. Okay, so once again, when an individual becomes a non-resident of Canada and they leave Canada, they sever their ties and, they're, and when they're actually considered a non-resident, which is different than you know, an American moving to Canada because Americans, by virtue of their citizenship, maintain taxation, uh, so much different. So Canadian leaves, severs ties, becomes a non-resident of Canada. Uh, not all of your assets, because if you have Canadian real estate or some resource properties uh, or RSPs, uh, those are not deemed to be disposed, but just regular investment accounts um, are deemed to be disposed. So as if you know you um, you sold them. So once again, let's use a very simple example. You had Apple stock that you paid $100 for. When you leave Canada, it's worth $200. Um, when you leave Canada and you become a non-resident, that $100 of gain is fully taxed in that year that you leave. Now, the question they're asking is what happens, and, and you're assuming that you didn't actually sell the Apple stock. You're down in the US now. You still own uh, however many shares of, um, of Apple stock uh, with original cost base of $100. Um, so they're asking now when I sell it, do I um, pay tax on the full $100 or, um, or a different amount? Um, and um, and there's, some, there's some relief here. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense, and it doesn't seem very fair that you pay hundred dollars of gain to the U.S. or to Canada, and a couple of years later you pay hundred dollar gain to the U.S. with no offsetting foreign tax credit. So within the treaty, um, there and let me think the so Article uh, Article thir Article thirteen paragraph seven, I think I think that's right. Article thirteen paragraph seven, um, uh, that paragraph outlines just this, where you can elect to be treated the same on the US side as you were on the Canadian side. So essentially all that happens, it gives you a bump to your cost base on that Apple share to $200. So when you sell it, your new basis is 200. Um, if it goes above 200, you'll have US tax, but um, you won't have to pay that tax on the original 100. Now you want to elect within your, and I'm not sure if this individual elected, he probably, you know, he or she didn't likely, but you're gonna wanna talk to somebody because you, you want to elect uh, under the treaty uh, to have that section apply with that treaty election form, the 8833. Um, and that's where you would, you know, you put that form in the 1040 to explain what you're doing and what section of the, um, the treaty um, that you're electing. So, uh, but yeah, but technically speaking, yes, you can get a bump for, for that amount. Okay. So um, now, yeah. So the question that somebody had here, what about uh, departing capital gains for us? Was there anything else there that you wanted me to um, to talk about? If if so, just just drop it in in the questions there. So I don't want to I don't want to miss anything. Okay. Uh, okay. I inherited an account, which is the reason I'm pursuing this rather than filing my own, which I normally do. I believe there's a form I need to submit to Canada declaring my inheritance, but the form number escapes me at the moment. Okay. 
Okay, so it sounds like this individual uh, re um, inherited um, an account, uh, likely um, sounds like maybe from the US. Um, I'm going to assume it's from the US, and they're asking like what um, what other forms um, do they need to file? So let's and I don't have a lot of information for this question, but let's assume that it's just an inve a regular investment account in the US. Uh, so in that case, uh, they likely have T1135 filings. So to the extent that you have over $100,000 of cost in um, non-US or non-Canadian investment accounts, you'll actually have to complete, um, sorry, this thing keeps going off behind me. Um, you'll have to complete that 1135 form uh, for um, declaring the US investments. So that's likely the form they're talking about. In the case of a trust, if the... Um, if the individual uh, inherited an amount that was part of a trust and they received distributions from that trust, whether capital or, um, or income, then there would be a T1142 form, which is um, a foreign uh, trust distrib uh, distribution form. So it could be the T1135 or the T1142 um, that they're, they're talking about. That's like, but we don't have, we don't have like a, a gift tax um, form or uh, or disclosures for the Canadian side. So once again, if you know, I mean, I'll have a lot of information for some of these questions. Um, if that's not 100% clear, feel free to email me whoever um, sent in this question. Okay. Um, okay, so this is okay. So this was just a follow up to the deemed disposition, turning the question around when depart permanently from US to Canada. Do I have to pay mark to market as deemed disposed? Okay, so yeah, so the a good question. So um, going the other way, when you move from the US to Canada, now, once again, it depends. If you're a US citizen, you're going to continue filing in the US. So no, there's nothing that happens necessarily. I mean, there's planning that has to happen, but there's no deemed disposition of assets. Um, if, if you're um, giving up your green card, or if you're on a visa down there, it really depends, and we can't get into that today. But um, you know, you might if you if you're expatriating, there's certainly some some implications. If you're under two million in, in net worth, there are less implications, um, and it depends whether you're a long-term resident in the U.S. But if I'm if 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 I'm assuming you're a U.S. person, um, there's there's no immediate consequences, but there's a bunch of planning for investments uh, before you uh, move to Canada. The worst thing you can do is move to Canada, wait a couple months, and then try to find a cross-border um, planner and then uh, try to plan. You want to plan before you become a, a Canadian resident uh, for sure, because a lot of the planning mechanisms don't um, aren't available once you become a resident of, um, of Canada, you know, things like Roth IRA conversions and, and whatnot. Okay. Uh, oh, now there's another one come in here. Um, no, that's the... Um, Oh, okay. The idea was a follow up to the TOD, um, the the transfer on death. Essentially, means a beneficiary has been named uh, on a non registered account, which is the same thing. Just inheriting a non registered account would be um, uh, the same thing. So, if it's in the U.S. and you have U.S. assets, um, then it would be a T eleven thirty five filing uh, to report the assets. I mean, that's just one. You know, that's one part of it. You'd actually have to. Um, make sure the withholdings are appropriate on there. I'm not sure if this is for a U.S. person or not. Um, and then and then planning around that investment account. Okay. Um, let's make sure I don't miss anybody here. Okay, so let's try. How are we doing for time? Okay, not bad here. I'm not, honestly, I don't know um, how long we'll go here, but um, I don't mind sticking around for as long as I can if people have questions. So, um, okay, so next question here. Uh, I'll be doing my cross-border taxes for the first time by myself and just wanted to hear what type of advice you can give me. Thanks for doing this. Thank you for the question. Um, well, the answer to this question is probably don't. Um, and I know that's tough for a lot of people. I mean, I, 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 you know, I wish there was a, a way, especially for simple returns, for people to really do them well on their own. But it, this is analogous to like, honestly, me trying to you know, change the brakes in my car. It's, it's, it's so difficult to do properly. And it requires so much experience because everybody's situation is so different. That being said, if your situation is so straightforward where you might have a T4 um, uh, for employment income, and that's all you have, 
Um, it's certainly doable. You might, you know, you do your Canadian return with Canadian tax software. You do um, your U.S. return with um, uh, you know, whatever U.S. software that you you can find, and you have a twenty five fifty five um, uh, earned income exclusion. So there's really no calculation at all, other than you know an in and out of the uh, employment income on the ten forty. And then once again, and this is assuming you have no investments, you make sure you do your F bars properly because F bars done incorrectly or filed late can be um, can be terrible. Um, so certainly doable, but once you, once you, when you have rental income, you have investments, you have other deductions, it becomes, it just becomes tricky. So, you know, there's certainly options. So if you want to do it yourself, there's, you know, you can, you know, um, there's really no, there's no program that does both of them together, uh, no retail program and not even a professional program. Like in the office, we use separate Canadian, um, tax software and separate U S tax software. And the two don't communicate with each other at all. Um, and, you know, we get this question all the time. Why does somebody not design that? Um, and gr great question. I mean, it's just the, mar the market's probably too small. And what would be required to do that would be enormous, even for software engineers, because they'd need the tax side and the software side. But um, so if you're going to do it yourself, you would have to have two separate pieces of software. Um, and there are there are actually um, uh, services out there like um, like Marcus at uh, Expat. My expat tax taxes; those guys are are great. Um, however, I mean, for simple returns, I wouldn't do anything complex with them. But but um, that's another option. So check them out. They're um, um, I've heard good things, but I haven't tried any of their um, uh, their software packages. Okay, um, just looking at some questions that have come in here. Okay, so we'll just there's quite a few here. So I'm just going to keep going with some of the questions that have come in um, earlier. Okay. Okay, next question. If a group of foreign persons sold a U.S. property, but only one person receives the IRS stamped copy B of Form 8288A with the total proceeds withholding included, uh, is it okay for the individual seller to fi file the U.S. 1040? retrieve any potential refund and later divide it amongst the other sellers or will the 8288A and B be amended to include the sellers? Okay. Um, so what this individual is talking about, they sold a property in the U.S. And when they sell a property in the U.S., um, there's withholdings that happen on the U.S. side that go to the IRS. And they do that to make sure that you file a tax return. And we actually see, I've, I've seen this quite a bit over the last couple of years here. Um, especially leading, like, um, maybe not last couple of years, but spe specifically after 2008, when the U.S. Um, housing uh, market recovered after the first crash, um, and a lot of Canadians bought down in the U.S. when um, uh, when the rate was at par. Um, so I would say, I mean, it's probably too late now. You want to get them to amend this if you catch it early enough, because it can be a huge pain. So they're saying, let's say, you know, uh, two individuals, let's say it's uh, spouses, you know, purchase a property. Um, and they, because um, when you file as a non-resident in the U, I'm assuming these are, you know, these are not U.S. persons. Um, when you file um, uh, as a non-resident, uh, you file separate returns and you don't have joint filing in the U.S. So let's say, you know, they sold a property in the U.S. and they withheld twenty thousand dollars. They'll often do the eighty-two eighty-eight on one uh, for one person, and then put the twenty thousand dollars to their IRS account. But you're going to be filing two tax returns and claiming you want to claim $10,000 on each tax return. So when you file the tax returns and you claim the 10,000, they need to see that 8288 disclosure on the returns in order to give you credit for the um, 10,000. So we've seen it a bunch of ways. In some cases, you can just put the full amount of the 20,000 on one return and get the refund. Um, I've, I've split it before and put in a, a cover letter. Each situation is so different. I would just say, you know, the lesson here is probably if you can get them to amend it quickly, I would if it's gone on and it's already at the IRS. Um, you might want to put a cover letter on there. I mean, the, the cases I'm thinking, we had to go back and forth quite a bit um, to get it resolved. So, you, you know, the, the lesson here is you want to get those forms completed um, accurately first because getting it done after the fact can be a real pain. Okay. Um, okay, looks like everybody's good there. Okay, so we're getting through lots of questions. Let's see what else we have next here. Um, and once again, you know, I, you know, I've done this as as a test for me to really get used to the the streaming software. Um, and as as you can see here, I, I wasn't able to even get the um, 
yeah, the YouTube thing's not working, but that's okay. Uh, but in subsequent ones, I'll actually I'll have a, a topic and run through some slides that'll be a little bit more focused. Um, and then um, I have some some guests lined up, which is going to be great. Some immigration attorneys, um, some other tax people, some investment people. So um, should be some stuff really to look forward to here in the in the coming months. Okay, um, I'll be moving permanently back to Canada within a year when I sell my house in Arizona and transfer the funds from the sale to Canada. What are the Canadian tax implications on this money, including the money I made from the favorable exchange rate? Okay. So this is this is um, this is similar to what we we talked about um, a, a few minutes ago. So assuming the sale happens, um, and is it very clear here uh, when I sell my house? If the sale happens before you move to Canada, there won't really be any Canadian implications. But let's assume you sell it after you move to Canada to become a resident. So you'll get the same bump. So you'll get the you know the fair market value of the Arizona property when you enter Canada. Um, will be your new cost basis. So unless, and it's, it's, it's much more difficult with real estate compared to stocks. With stocks, you know, you can see the difference in value. Let's say if you moved in, in November 1st to November 30th, you, can, you, you know what the, the change in value was. For real property, is very difficult. So, you know, assuming the Arizona property didn't move in value from the time you moved to Canada, there might be a small gain. Um, and that's where the foreign exchange can kick in too. It, it might just be, you know, you, you might have a, um, a gain just because of the way the foreign tax um, exchange rate moved. Uh, but, you know, if, if you did actually sell it before, really no implications. And then moving money um, is a completely, you know, different conversation. Um, and a lot of times with moving money, you know, the question we get a lot is, you know, how do I get a favorable exchange rate? Um, and there, there's certainly some places online. The best way is, you know, if you have a good investment advisor up here, especially cross border, they can get, you know, spot rates for um, exchange. I would certainly stay away from the banks just because the big banks, the spreads on those exchange rates are, are horrendous, uh, especially with large sums of money. Anything over 100,000 or even maybe even over 50,000, I wouldn't use, I would never use a bank rate. Um, it's... Um, yeah, it's it's terrible what they're what they're charging, especially when they have access to you know the most liquid pools of foreign exchange. So, okay, um, so let's see. Any other questions come in here? Um, okay, uh, good question here um, regarding moving from the U.S. to Canada. I believe the U.S. person can still hold U.S. The U.S. brokerage account, but only able to sell stocks and not buy anymore. Is that true? On the other hand, if one can find a stock broker that has both Canadian U.S. licenses and then one can still trade U.S. account, is that true? Um, yeah, I mean, it's getting a lot more difficult. So if you, you know, I always use the example of Fidelity, you know, you know, pushing out clients very quickly and liquidating things. Um, yeah, the U.S. brokerage accounts or brokers don't want to hold anything. And they're not, for the most part, not allowed to hold investment accounts for Canadian residents. And in some cases, they might be able to have them down there, but then they can't trade on them. So that's, I mean, that's a terrible way to even have an account down there. Because a lot of times, you know, the investments in there don't work well for can Canadian purposes. So almost always, it makes sense to transfer them up to a cross-border advisor that can, um, that can help. Um, and if you're going to do it yourself, then, you know, you, you know, use something like interactive brokers if, um, if, if you are managing your own, um, your own money. Um, what's the second part of that question? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then, and then and then just I mean, we get this all the time. Well, what if I put, you know, my sister or brother or parents, you know, US address on the US account? Well, all you're doing there is lying on a form and you don't want to do that, especially if the advisor down there has told you to do that. I, I hear that all the time. That's terrible advice. I mean, you're, you're essentially you're lying on a form on an investment form to keep it down there when they can't even manage the, the funds legally. So so don't do that. So reach out to a good cross border investment advisor because um, and not only that, you might have, like I always say, you'll have muni bonds down there, perhaps, you know, there's nothing wrong with US dividends, but in a lot of cases, you know, the Canadian dividends might be more tax efficient. So you want somebody to look at it from a Canadian perspective, because so many uh, portfolios I look at, look at have, um, um, you know, muni bond interest is a great example, right? Tax free in the US, not tax free in Canada. So the value of the muni bonds is completely wiped out or even investments with capital gains distributions on the US side that are treated as straight income on the Canadian side. So tax inefficient. Um, and you wouldn't know it until somebody looked at it um, and, and went through and, and kind of showed you the difference in, in tax that you'd be paying in Canada versus um, the US in a brokerage account. Um, okay, just going through here. Okay, thank you for the questions. All right, we're getting through quite a few here. Time's it. Okay. All right. 
and nobody's dropped off yet. So that's, that's good news. All right. I know some of this stuff can be um, quite dry, but um, uh, it can also, it can also be quite educational if, if these are the questions you're, you're uh, asking. Okay. So next question here. Um, from the perspective of a typical cross-border couple who are already a Canadian resident and contemplating retiring in Ontario in the next couple of years, what would likely be the most tax efficient way to sequence the drawdown of US um, and Canadian financial assets, 401k, IRA, Roth, RSP, RIF, US investments, Canadian investments? Okay, good question. Get this all the time. I mean, first thing I would say is, um, I mean, you want to plan for this before you're doing any drawdown, right? So if you're moving to Canada from the US, you want to look at all the investments. There might be some investments that you sell before you enter Canada. You might you know, convert some of your Roth to, or some of your IRA to a Roth. Uh, you might convert your 401k to an IRA. There might be a bunch of things you, and you need to do that before you become a Canadian resident. So just make sure that you're doing that planning before, um, before you move to Canada. Um, but just generally speaking, in terms, because the question is, you know, the sequence of drawdowns, and this is, this is very general um, advice. Um, but you want to probably pull from, you know, the RIF accounts first, um, and potentially the U, the, you know, the the, the non-registered investment accounts, you know, the ones that um, uh, that are after tax, um, because the Roth and the IRAs are the ones that, you know, if inherited by um, by children, can um, can be you know, deferred for another 10 years. So those are the ones, because all these investments can roll to the spouse tax-free. So, you know, once the second spouse passes away, if you still have the Ross and the IRAs and those haven't been drawn down as much, you know, you, you're always going to have your minimum withdrawals. So that's, you know, that's going to be, that, you know, something you're going to have to take regardless. But um, if you have a choice, you want to keep those accounts intact and let them just compound and grow over, over time. Once again, Compounding over ten years makes just a huge, a, a, a huge difference. So, um, and once again, you know, you know, they'll have to, you know, even when, even if they have to withdraw those funds, you know, um, if the kids have to withdraw the funds in ten years, it might be that they're in a much lower tax bracket than you, anyways, and they reinvest those funds in RSPs or whatever, and you continue with that, um, uh, that compounding growth. So, um, kind of a, a general, you know. Uh, answer to that question, but it's hard to get into the specifics without really sitting down and, and doing full planning. Okay. These are all great questions. Thank you all for sending them. These, these are amazing. Okay. Um, can I keep all my investments in the U.S. if I became a Canadian resident? I have dual citizenship, Canada, U.S. Are there tax consequences? So we've we already talked about this. I wouldn't keep them in the U.S. because, I mean, the question is, like, what's the... You know, what's the what's the value? What's the advantage of keeping them in the U.S.? I mean, maybe if you're managing your own funds and, and you really understand it, but the problem with having the U.S. investments in the U.S., especially if they're managed by a U.S. investor, they likely have no conception of Canadian tax, which is fair enough. I mean, I, you know, I don't, wouldn't expect anybody to. The conception of Canadian tax or planning. So a lot of things are being left on the table. Um, uh, and the way in which those portfolios are, are designed are likely not um, great from a Canadian perspective. But and then, and and then, most U.S. brokerages cannot even hold um, non uh, non registered um, investment accounts for Canadian residents, anyway. So, uh, but we yeah we touched on that quite a bit in previous questions. Okay, let's try this question here. U.S. investor has been told ITIN is expiring, but need to file for rental income. How to quickly how to quickly to renew without giving up passport. Uh, so we can file quickly. Um, can a Canadian can contract consulting in the U.S.? Oh, okay. So essentially, what this person's asking is, how do they renew their I-10? I think. So, um, to the extent that you're not um, a U.S. person or a green card holder or, or um, a U.S. citizen, uh, you you know you, you have a social security number. But if you need to file a U.S. tax return, so that you might have, let's say, you have a, a property in Arizona or um, you know rental property anywhere in the U.S. and you're filing 1040 NRs, um, they're going to give you an individual tax identification number. Um, so what happens a lot of times these I-10s they expire and you have to renew them. I mean, one of the reasons for this many years ago. Um, People were fraudulently, you know, uh, uh, claiming dependence on 1040 returns um, and collecting huge amounts of refunds. So um, they've had a lot of these ITINs expire automatically. Uh, but a lot of times, when people have to continue filing, they need to renew them. So I would say you can renew them um, without a tax return. So 
the, the best way to renew an I-10 is just to file it with the tax return. Uh, but what they're asking here is um, they don't want to give up their passport. So one way of doing it, which I would never recommend, is to send in the, um, the uh, W-7 application, which is the uh, application for um, renewing or just getting a new, um, uh, a brand new I-10. And you need to show identification. So one of the options is to package up the W-7 with your passport and send it off to them in the mail. So, and then they, they actually do send it back to you, but I would never risk having my passport in the mail. Um, so what you can do is you can actually just go down to the passport office. And I know, I mean, it's been tricky because the passport office has been so busy lately, but um, you can go down to the Canadian passport office. You can get a, um, uh, a certified copy of the passport. So what they'll do, they'll take a copy, they'll certify it, and that can go down with the W-7 to get the item. So that's probably the best. Um, that certainly will be the, the best option. You don't want to you don't want to throw your passport in the in the mail and hope it comes back, uh, especially with all the lineups at the passport office. Okay, let's see what's next. So like Jeopardy here. All right. Um, I don't know if this even fits, but I'm thinking of taking my social security next year when I turn 62. I also thought about taking my CPP now. Since I'm unable to work anymore and it's only a few hundred dollars, do I need to do both at the same time? Uh, okay, you, you don't need to do both at the same time. Um, you know, the longer you wait, the more you'll, you'll get if you defer both CPP and, and social security. Uh, the only thing I would say there is just know that your social security can be reduced um, and we won't get into the calculation here by your CPP. Uh, so the best way to actually work that out is actually to call the social security administration and say, okay, well, I'm thinking about taking social security. I'll be taking CPP as well and just see how much your social security will be ground down by the, um, um, by the, the social security rules. Um, once again, it's kind of a topic you can get down to the weeds in, but um yeah, you, you can certainly do both at the same time. Just just know that your social security will get ground down by your uh, 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 your social security get ground down by your CPP, uh, not necessarily dollar for dollar, but uh, they can tell you the calculation at the department. Okay. Um, okay. Curious. Um, curious if there's a fairly comprehensive list somewhere, tax related questions, people looking to re relocate from the US to Canada should get answers to go before we go a place to begin where those of us know we don't know where to begin. Fair enough. Uh, what questions we should be looking for and who to go to to ask various, uh, various questions. Okay, great question. Um, well, I would say I mean, there's not a lot of great places because it's such a niche specialization, I would say, um, you know, my blog has a ton of Q and A's and, and articles on uh, moving to Canada from the US. So that would be a good place to start. Um, so philhogan.com. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to do better to maybe try to organize this in, you know, in, in, um, in some of the resource um, pages, but, um, you know, you can search on here and, and there's, you know, there's years and years of, of articles. The YouTube page um, has a bunch of podcasts and, and videos related to um, uh, just what you're asking there. Um, one good place, and I actually saw this question, I just put this up here, um, Phil Hodgen, which is interesting, not Phil Hogan, Phil Hodgen um, is another cross-border lawyer or, or a cross-border lawyer. Um, and his site is absolutely amazing. He, he, he's been doing this for a long time. Um, and the amount of educational information he puts out on this, um, this website is, is great. It's quite technical, uh, but I would suggest this one. Um, search through this. He has uh, great content, uh, really, really knows his stuff. He's been doing it for a long time. Uh, and the resources on this, this website are just absolutely phenomenal. Um, there's some other, I mean, off the top of my head, if you Google the Serbinsky forum, that's a forum with Q and A's that um, has actually been around for a long time. Um, yeah, it's 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 tough. It's I mean, it's it's just kind of a hodgepodge of articles, and there's no real big guys out there. There's actually there's there's some decent books, and I don't know how, how updated they've been, but there's some books um, like uh, Moving to Canada or Americans in Canada that were written by some of the tax professionals back in the day. You might want to check those out, but. Um, 
Yeah. Oh, yes. And then, of course, uh, uh, our Facebook page, Americans in Canada Facebook page, there'll be a link at the at the end here. That's a great place to, to ask your questions because the community there has been absolutely amazing. Um, I mean, I try to answer some of the questions, but um, it's it's um, it's tough. But, you know, a lot of people are giving good answers to um, a lot of the questions, especially when they relate to maybe non tax items, but just moving to Canada in general. So that's a great place to um, ask your question. I'd spend a lot of time trying to moderate that to keep spam out. Uh, but once again, the community has been absolutely amazing. I'm sure a lot of you um, on uh, the stream today uh, are part of that group. Um, so yeah, ask your question there because um, yeah, that, that group has been great. Okay, so uh, let's see what we have next. Um, Okay, I'm a Canadian who married an American and moved to the US in 86. My husband passed away in 2015, and I'm considering moving back to Vancouver or Toronto. I would be living on investment income or digging into principal. From listening to your show, I believe I need to file, in effect, sell all of my investments and repurchase them the day after moving, right? Okay, well, no, that's not right. I don't think I've ever said to sell all your investments um, and repurchase them after moving. They might be thinking like the actual um, the actual language in the in in the tax act is that you're deemed to have purchased and resold, uh, but that's usually on um, you know um, or th that's on the way in in into Canada. So you're, you know purchased and um, or sell and, and repurchase. But yeah, I would never advise anybody to sell all their investments and then repurchase them when they when they move to Canada. Um, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll, you know, look at por portfolios. Some things um, you might want to sell. Some investments can't be held in a you know, Canadian brokerage account because let's say they're proprietary to you know, Fidelity or, or UBS, some, some specific firm. Um, but you certainly want to do planning. You want to do planning for the investments before you move to Canada. Because um, a big part of that is, you know, we talk about this a lot, you know, the 1135 filing. Um, to the extent that you have U.S., investments in the US and you're a Canadian resident, you have you will have terrible 1135 filings. So essentially, every line of every statement will have to be disclosed on that uh, foreign disclosure, that T1135 form, if the assets remain in the US versus lumping them all into one group if they're in a Canadian uh, brokerage account. So um, yeah, so the lesson here is just make sure you do planning for your investments before you move to Canada. But no, you're, you're not going to have to sell everything and repurchase it after moving. You can easily move investments up in kind from U.S. investment accounts to uh, Canadian investment accounts. Once again, you want to do that with a good cross-border team, but um, yeah, you won't have to sell everything and repurchase. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so it looks like that's the, the last question I have on here. Um, it doesn't look like there's a lot of questions coming in here. Does anybody else have any specific questions on this that they want to ask? I do have, um, I did have some questions come in. So maybe what I can do, I can look to see. Okay, so this morning we had some people join. Oh, there's even more here now. So let's see. Oh, wow, that's a long question. Okay, so I have one that's very lengthy that it'll be probably too much to even read through for the group or for the group here. Let's see if there's anything quick I can. You know, these are just people registering. Okay. Yeah, and it's, there's some questions about foreign trusts. Um, grant or non grant or trust. I'm not going to get into that today. That stuff is so technical and it requires so much planning. I would say if you have a, you know, foreign trust I issues, like reach out. Um, you know, we often require, or we often need, you know, to get some tax, um, some cross border tax lawyers involved to um, uh, redo some of these trusts or move, you know, um, assets out of the trust um, into uh, personal names. Um, we work with some really good cross-border um, lawyers in, in Vancouver. Unfortunately, Victoria, we don't have a ton of cross-border lawyers to help, but um, we certainly have um, some, some good lawyers over in, um, in Vancouver. Yeah, if any, and if anybody's looking, I would reach out to um, Christine Muckle at Legacy Tax in Vancouver. So big shout out to Christine Muckle. She, she's great. She's helped lots of my clients. Absolutely amazing. Been in the game for um, for a long time, doing very specific cross-border work. So if anybody needs help with um, 
uh, with their their foreign trusts or um, uh, legal um, estate planning. She's um, she's great. I mean, on the tax side, you want to kind of bring in the whole group. But um, and if anybody needs a referral, just reach out to me at phil at philhogan.com and I can I can help. Okay. Um, oh, there were some other questions here that came in. Um, oh, okay, so good question. Um, how does Canada treat U.S. health saving plans? Do these qualify for deferral? Yeah, I mean, unless something has come out in recent times here, I, those are not deferred for Canadian purposes. So just straight investment accounts. So anything earned within the HSAs, those, those can be a pain because they can be quite beneficial for people, especially when they move back up. Uh, but those should be fully taxable for Canadian purposes. Um, okay, who are some good cross-border teams to manage investments for Americans in Canada, perf um, preferably fee for service or low AUM? Okay, I mean, um, I, I would say if anybody if anybody needs a referral, I mean, we work a lot with some teams at Raymond James that are absolutely great uh, and have been doing this for a long time and very specific to that. So I would say. Um, because that question is is very specific to that kind of cross border team to manage investments. So, if you if you need help with um, uh, managing your cross border investments, just send me an email and I can kind of tag in. I can tag in the team. So um, I think that's what you're you're asking. Thank you, Mark. That's that's great great question. Um, what obligations remaining U.S. person but permanently living in Canada as a Canadian citizen? Uh, what does that mean? What obligations remaining U.S. person but permanently living in Canada as a Canadian citizen? Are, are, are you asking what are the obligations for a U.S. citizen living in, in Canada? I mean, if you're asking that question, then um, yeah, I mean, if you, if you haven't renounced your U.S. citizenship, which you know most of my clients haven't renounced their U.S. citizenship, um, you'll have U.S. tax returns to do. So generally speaking, it looks like you have a Canadian return every year, you have U.S. tax return every year, and then you have a um, um, then you have uh, your FBAR filings and all the other disclosures. You might have T1135 filings. Um, so yeah, you'll be taxable on the Canadian and US side um, not necessarily means you're paying US tax, just means you have to file in, in both countries. Um, okay, managing all the costs involved in index investing, any benefits using US ETFs versus Canadian ETFs and non-registered accounts. Overall, is it better to build my own ETF with Canadian stocks? Oh, that's such a loaded question. Um, so generally speaking, the reason it's challenging to try to build these like your own portfolio of, of US and Canadian stocks, because um, a lot of times people are doing that to avoid PFIC reporting, which honestly doesn't have to be that difficult if you don't have 30 or 40 mutual funds. It becomes difficult when you're first, when you have you know, a portfolio full of Canadian mutual funds that don't have QEF statements, qualifying electing fund statements. Um, then you have a lot of 8621s to complete. But if, if, if the portfolios are structured properly with one or two diversified global you know, ETFs um, that, that are considered PFIX, um, that's probably much better than trying to develop a whole portfolio of individual stocks. And the reason for that, and I'm not opposed to individual stocks at all, but the reason for that is when you start disposing of these stocks, you have to uh, you know, on the Canadian side, it's easy. You know, you might get you know a, a gain loss report shows you your thirty thousand dollars or you know, whatever your gain is for the year. You report that on your Canadian return. But for U.S. purposes, you actually have to um, uh, you have to convert all those to U.S. dollars. And it's not as simple as like you know I have a thirty thousand dollar gain in Canada. You know, thirty thousand um, dollars divided by the exchange rate for that year. That's not how that works. You have to convert at the day you purchase. You have to convert at the day you sell. And the difference is, you know, your gain or loss, and then you also have to factor in the foreign exchange. Um, so we have huge Excel models that we use in in the office to do this. That you know, you know, we input all this stuff, and then it calculates. It's a ton of time. Um, so I would say, if you have, you know, if if, if you have a portfolio, you know, there's going to be transactions in it. I'd be very careful about you know, individual stocks because of the work required to do it. Now, some people would say, oh, I, you know, I do this and it's fine almost in every single case I see, like it's fine because they're not, they're not doing it properly. They're not converting the Canadian gains properly to US. So just be very careful about doing that. Um, 
and so then you know the, the other part of the question us ETFs versus canadian ETFs. you know if it's a us etf then you don't have PPIC uh, reporting requirements and that's fine um if you're comfortable with you know that you know how, how to you know if you're if that's how you're developing your portfolio but once again that's you now that, that you know that's really somebody that's managing their own money and very comfortable doing that uh but yeah that's one way to get out of PPIC reporting i don't know if it's the reason to own us etfs because you know, you really have to make sure that you manage um, foreign exchange uh, fluctuation and, and look at look look at you know a recent example. You know, we went from like a buck twenty five to almost a buck forty on the U.S. return on the U.S. dollar um, within a couple months, right? Um, so depending on what you're going to be doing, you know, um, with your your portfolio, um, I mean that's a huge swing. Now that might work out in your favor, but it also might. Not so. If you're going to do it, just be very comfortable knowing that you actually um, can manage the funds yourself, and then and then the foreign currency risk as well. I mean, you know, there's ways to hedge it and whatnot, but I mean, those are pretty specific um, um, skill sets. So, um, okay. So let's see here. Um, Okay, so a question. Okay, some some covered expats are subject to ex exit tax if they meet certain conditions. Um, does this only apply to U.S. citizen green card holders? For example, if Canadian citizen worked in the U.S. for twenty plus years but never became a green card holder. Are they exempt? Yeah. So you know, and this, I mean, you can go down the rabbit hole with this, um, and we want to be careful about answering any questions about covered expats. But yeah, if you weren't, um, you have to be considered a long-term resident. So eight out of the last fifteen years. But that shouldn't apply to anybody that was not a green card holder. So you actually have to be a green card holder. But I would say if you're dealing with any expatriation covered expat stuff, you want to reach out and talk to somebody and really flush out these answers because um, you don't want to get you don't want to get that wrong, um, especially for expatriation purposes. It can it can get quite technical. But yeah, if you're not a U.S. if you're not a green card holder, you shouldn't be considered a long term resident. Um, that's probably the, the short answer there. Okay. Yeah, so I don't. Doesn't look like there's any new questions coming in. This might be the time to wrap it up. But what I'll do here. Okay. Um, uh, oh, there are more questions. Okay. Um, Let's see here, uh, which line on form 1040 to declare my election for the stock that I bumped up to cost base when I left Canada and which treaty number and paragraph again. Uh, so, so that's, it's not really a line item. That's you're electing under the treaty. So it's, um, and once again, this is not professional advice. You want to, you want to sit down with somebody and, and work through this properly, but um, that, that's form 8833. 8833 is the treaty election form. Um, and it should be par it should be article 13 of the treaty paragraph um, uh, paragraph seven. So make sure you um, uh, look that up to make sure. I, I think that's the, the, the right paragraph. Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, on a Canadian POA, if a US person is named as an alternate or successive attorney, is FBAR required? I know. Filing is required if a U.S. person's name as an attorney. Uh, Yo, know, that's a that's a good question. Um, I, I mean, so FBAR filing will only relate to U.S. persons, and it will only relate to U.S. persons that have ownership or signing authority over an account. So, if it's not a U.S. person, likely not. But you want to run down the chain with that and, and be very careful because if it's if you're a POA for a U.S. person, I would say you're going to want to get some advice about that, especially if you have significant uh, significant accounts. It's interesting. Um, I mean, we certainly have POAs, but it's usually individuals that are already U.S. citizens. Uh, you know, it might be a um, a child who's a POA for their their parents, but they're all U.S. citizens. So, good question. But um, yeah, you want to probably get some follow up with that. Um, okay, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, Okay. Uh, will the TFSA result in U.S. trust and FBAR filings? Okay, so we did touch on this a little bit. 
you know, if you're making the argument that the TFSA is not a foreign trust, then you won't have foreign trust filing. So those 3520s, but some people are still doing those. So that's still a point of contention in the, um, in the industry here. Um, the IRS hasn't really ruled on it. So um, that's a conversation you want to have with your tax professional, whether you're going to consider the TFSA a foreign trust or not. If you do consider it a foreign trust, you likely have 3520 filings, uh, but certainly you, it, it's included on the FBAR. So all those accounts are included on your FBAR. So your RSPs are included on your FBAR, your, um, your TFSAs, your uh, Canadian investment accounts, your Canadian bank accounts. Yeah, so TFSA is certainly included on the FBAR. Um, Canadian resident staying in the U.S. longer than 183 days. Has there been some change to the calculation for filing U.S.? It seems to remember a change to snowbird rules. Um, it was interesting because we just put up a... Um, uh, I mean, the snowbird rule changes, uh, I, I think, related to COVID. It's interesting. We don't do a lot of snowbird returns at all um, on that side. It's mainly just Americans coming into Canada and, and very, very few people kind of going down, uh, snowbirds even just moving down to the U.S. But um, so there's two things. There's the um, substantial presence test. So I actually designed a calculator on the website. So if you go to um, the website under resources, uh, or just I would just Google uh, Phil Hogan um, um, substantial presence calculator. Um, but if you're over 183 days, um, that will be different than actually being a substantial presence um, individual for the the, the th three years. So um, I'm not sure if I really answered your 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 question there. Um, maybe just maybe just shoot me an email with with the set of fact patterns, and I can I'll I'll do my best to help there. I'm trying to, if I if I'm not really answering these questions um, in totality, I, I don't want to leave anybody hanging. So just shoot me a, a, an email on that. Uh, let's see here. Okay, TFC. If I want to open a TFC with U.S. cash deposits, how do I ensure I do not run over my TFC limit? How documents how to document to make sure I'm not over my lifelong TFSA. Okay, well, that's a really good question. I mean, that's um, that's tricky because, well, I don't know if it's tricky because when you deposit to the TFSA, they will, on their end, they will convert an amount to Canadian because they have to be tracking that balance if that's what you're asking. Um, they must be doing that at the brokerage side because that's the only way for them to know that you've either gone above or below your limit because it's being tracked. So they probably do it. They probably do it on the day that the amount goes in there. So they probably do it on the exchange rate, the day, the exchange rate on the day you actually um, deposit the money to the TFSA. But that's a good question. I don't know if I've ever run into that. Um, I don't know for sure, but I, I think it's, I think it's probably on the day that you deposit it. Um, um, I'm a trustee and beneficiary of a Canadian family trust. Do I have 3520 filings in the U.S. as a U.S. resident alien? Um, oh, I would, yeah, I would say likely yes. And once again, if we're not going to get into the the weeds of 3520s, I mean, honestly, we try to stay away from as much of those filings as possible. And the reason for that um, is a good example. You go through like the instructions on a form like that. Even the IRS doesn't even know the answers to some of these questions on on the form themselves that they've developed so it, it's just there's so much risk in those forms but i would say um I, it sounds like yeah if you're if you're a u.s resident with and in your beneficiary and, and and trustee i mean yeah the one of those would probably kick you over unless as a beneficiary you didn't receive a distribution for 3520 filings and 3520a uh, but yeah if you're a u.s resident i would say yes without any further information yeah yeah um, Okay. All right. So looks like, oh, another one. Okay. And no, oh, I think they're answering that question. No distributions. Uh, yeah. But if you're the trustee and it, once again, you can go down to the weeds with this, but um, it depends on whether you're considered an owner or not. It's something you're really going to have to probably get some advice on. It's not something we can probably delve into today. And I, I hate that because it's, you know, I, I do want to be helpful, but 3520s are just, um, they're just a minefield. Um, uh, 
Okay, uh, following up somebody else previously, if I'm a POA for a parent with signing authority, I don't use it, but it's there as a US resident alien Canadian citizen, will I be subject to any violence? Okay, so that's a good example of like, if you're POA, and you have signing authority over um, any non US account, and that accounts over, you know, the highest balance and aggregates over $10,000, you, you likely have um, um, F bar filings, I mean, you might have, I mean, if, if you don't have ownership over the or beneficial ownership over the account, um, the income will be taxed somewhere else. But yes, yeah, certainly it sounds like F bar filings for sure. And for everybody, um, I mean, there's been some court cases, some pretty scary court cases have come out recently about this. But for anybody doing their own US return, make sure on that schedule B where you're reporting your investment income for US purposes, there's those questions at the bottom. Uh, do I have interest in a foreign account? You know, my filing um, F bars and you know what country they located, and then thirty five twenty question. Make sure to answer those questions. There was a, there was a case where somebody answered no to that question, and they hammered them with F bar penalties. So uh, once again, I'm you know I'm, I'm the last person to try to scare anybody about this because I don't. That's not how we we operate at all. It's not that's not how we we run the practice. Um, uh, I would never I would never do that. But I just these the recent court cases. Um, really have seemed to have changed the tide. So if you're doing your own tax returns, make sure check out those um, those questions on Schedule B because um, one of the cases I think hinged on the fact that that individual said no to that question. Uh, and once again, I don't I don't think any of this is fair. I think I think those penalties are are so severe compared to you know somebody you know actually just missing that form. And a lot of these penalties, and whether the the fifty four seventy one penalties or the thirty five twenty penalty, like ten thousand dollars per like um, late filing. I mean, those are absolutely not fair. I mean, those if, fair enough if you're a large company like Microsoft or Google, and you have like foreign holdings, and you have to file these forms, and you miss them. Sure, the tax department. I mean, they don't mind cutting checks for ten thousand dollars late penalties, but not for individuals. So it's it's so unfortunate that even exists. But um, right now, that's the, that's the case. Now that being said, I, we're not seeing a ton of those penalties. Um, but those recent court cases were um, quite scary, to be honest. Okay. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions come in. Let me just go back here. Okay, and I get, you know, I get these questions all the time. How can we reach out? Um, just keeping an eye on the Q&A here. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, best way to reach out, like I mentioned the Facebook group before, uh, that community, that community has been absolutely awesome. So, um, make sure to join there, um, ask your questions and then, um, please answer any questions that you feel you can, you can answer. I mean, the, the community is great because everybody's just so engaged and ready to help. Um, uh, you can check out the YouTube page. Uh, I have, um, a bunch of, it's just muted my. Mike there. Yeah. Uh, you, your YouTube page for um, all the videos and the podcast. You can sign up to the podcast on Apple podcasts as well. Um, I've been getting lots of um, thank yous for doing this on, on email, on the chat. I really appreciate that. The best way to, to, to um, show your appreciation for this is to um, um, leave me a Google review. If you guys could do that, that's the best way. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, only a couple of minutes and it makes a huge difference. So, um, you know, if you just go philhogan.com slash reviews, you can get there. If you just Google Phil Hogan CPA, you'll see on the right-hand side on Google, you can leave a review and just, um, just give your feedback about the, the webinar. Um, the more feedback I can, I can get, the more of these I can, I can do for sure. Um, once again, I'm going to try to do these, um, I mean, the Q and A's are great for sure. Uh, but you know, I'll get to me more specific topics. Um, and then we're going to get some guests on. So you don't have to necessarily just listen to me speak for, you know, an hour and a half, which, um, I'm sure can get kind of tiresome here. So, um, yeah, we'll have some investment advisors on here. We'll have some, um, immigration attorneys. I have one lined up. That's going to be a great, um, uh, interview. Um, and then, yeah, just really just cross border professionals. I mean, that's, that's really what we're, we're trying to put on the, the podcast on the YouTube, uh, channel. Um, oh, you're very welcome. Yes. Thank you for all the kind comments on the chats there. Um, let's see here. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I was just asked to put a link to the Facebook page. So what I'll do here is I can, I'll do that. Uh, 
make it easier for people to find it. And I'll just drop it in the chat here. One second and get to it. Okay, so let's see here. Okay, did that work for everybody? Um, okay, so hopefully that worked. And once again, all you know, all all that information's on the website. Um, it's on the YouTube page. I mean, it's really plastered everywhere. So if you go on the YouTube page and 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 click around or um, um, look at any of the videos, all all those links are there. Oh yeah, yeah. Another great place to um, kind of keep informed about what's going on. Um, if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, um, especially if you click the alert button, so if you subscribe and click the alerts, as soon as a new video is posted, then um, you'll be you'll be alerted. So uh, I'm gonna actually I'll get this one uploaded to the YouTube um, page, and then I'll put um, some chapters on there so you can click through to specific questions um, that we've that we've covered. Um, Oh, that's nice. Okay, so somebody said, thank you. Please send the link to the Google reviews page. I will do that right now. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Okay, so let's... A bigger screen here. Um, okay, so that should take you straight to. Oh, I should put. Yeah, that's an actual link there. That should work. Yes, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for everybody that that joined us today. This is I was not expecting this many people. You guys um, sent amazing questions. Um, so yeah, just I'm just so pleased um, with with the turnout. Um, and yeah, once again, just you know, if you're um, on the Facebook page, and I think most of you are going to be on the mailing list. So um, I'm going to try to I'll, you know the next one that happens, we'll we'll send it around, and hopefully it'll be a much more specific. Um, much more specific topics. I mean, most of what we're going to be talking about are, you know, Americans living in Canada and a lot of planning um, moving from Canada. Because I know, you know, a lot of you are in Canada already, but a lot of you are, are in the U.S. And, and might retire to Canada. So that might be um, quite helpful as well. So, okay, well, if there's if there are no other questions, I'll probably we'll probably leave it there. Um, once again, if um, anybody wants to reach out, Phil at Phil Hogan doc, um, or uh, Phil at philhogan.com is a great way to reach me. Um, and yeah, I just want to thank everybody again. This has been amazing. Great first test. I think it was pretty successful here. So um, like I said, we'll, we'll leave it there. And then um, uh, on the next one, any of the questions I haven't, um, I haven't answered, I'll try to compile them and we'll, we'll, we'll have them for the next one. So yeah, thank you everybody again, and we'll um, see you on the next one.